Hi, good morning and welcome to Hawaii Matters. My name is Devin. I am your host for this morning's show. We're very excited to have uh, Dr. Christina Bell, who is a geriatrician at Kaiser Permanent. Hey, good morning, Doc. Good morning, Devin. All right. Can we get into a little bit of the of your history uh, of working with geriatrics and stuff like that? Uh, where did you matriculate from? All of those kind of things. I graduated from Baldwin High School on Maui, and I went to the University of Hawaii for both undergraduate and medical school. My first job as a family physician was actually on the Big Island, um, and there I fell in love with my geriatric patients. I had a lot of the cowboys from the Shipman Ranch. And uh-huh. so that was when I discovered my passion for geriatrics, came back to the University of Hawaii, did my geriatric fellowship, and worked at the University of Hawaii, and now have joined Kaiser Permanente f- about four years ago. Oh, okay. So and do you, so you've seen the gamut of everything with regards to this stuff. So we're going to get pretty deep into the old uh, mm-hmm. geriatric medicine thing. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. First, um, I think people sometimes have a misconception about um, geriatric medicine. So could you kind of dive a little deeper and explain what all of that entails? Well, at Kaiser Permanente, um, our geriatric medicine um, services are in the clinics, but also in the the hospital, at Moanalua Hospital. We do um, care for our Hawaii Island patients as well as Maui. And a lot of our patients, when they come to the clinic for the first time, are very terrified to see us. Um, And what I like to tell folks is we geriatricians help the primary care physicians to keep you strong and active and help you age as well as you possibly can. So our role is not to label people and sort of end their lives. Our role is actually to help them really thrive in their older years and enjoy life. Um, We try to focus on quality of life. Very nice. Uh, Now, uh, diving a little deeper as we we go through uh, this morning's show, uh, what is dementia? How do we? Yeah, so this is probably our patient's biggest fear when they come to see us. I think a lot of people, when they hear the word dementia, they think it means that the person is crazy or that they need to go into a nursing home for the rest of their lives. But actually, um, dementia simply means memory problems that affect daily life. So it just means that the person is starting to need a little help because of either memory or organizational thinking problems. And so there's a wide range of dementia from very, very mild, where the person is still very, very functional, um, all the way to the end stage. And it's different in different people. Hmm. So uh, what would be some of the things that you would look for uh, with, I guess, early onset of dementia? Mm-hmm. Well, I think one of the things um, to think about is folks often ask us, do I have dementia or do I have just normal aging? And, and I think that that's actually a really important question to maybe talk about first, just because there are some normal changes with our brain with aging. So for example, folks process information a little bit more slowly as we get into our 70s, 80s, particularly the 90 year olds. And so it's normal for it to take a little while for someone to learn something new. For example, the remote control or the cell phone they just can't quite figure out that cell phone you know Mm. and that's pretty normal with aging so when you know grandma got a new uh, remote control and she's having trouble using it grandchildren please don't jump to the conclusion that grandma has dementia because it may be just normal aging you want to look for other things so again um, dementia is more of a broader problem with memory and thinking where they're having difficulty actually getting through their day. So not just difficulty with remote control, but maybe forgetting to change their clothes or forgetting to eat, Um, more difficulty with finances or with keeping track of their groceries, things like that. And would it be a consistent thing or would it be, you know, because everybody has their sort of brain (laughs) fart moment where, you know, you go, I forgot where that thing is. Uh, Is there a certain time where you go, okay, you're having way too many of these. There must be something else going on. 
I love that question. That's perfect. So yes, everybody has good days and bad days. I mean, my teenagers, you know, have bad days. <laughs> um, so one of the things though that we're looking for is that more consistent pattern. And especially what I love to do is look at people over time. So if we're seeing that over time compared to three months ago, compared to six months ago, compared to a year ago or five years ago, that there's definitely a change. That's when we start thinking more about things like dementia and really significant memory problems. Hmm, interesting. Um, now, we're talking about difference, uh, difficulty in thinking and memory. So mm -hmm. uh, it's remembering things that have happened or things that are happening or you know what I mean? I, oh, that's a great question yeah, I'm trying too. To figure that part yeah. Out, so what what we typically see um, is that we have short term memory and we have long term memory. So the long term memory, I'll come in and see folks, and they can tell me where they were born, where they went to elementary school. They can tell me all their really old memories. Those long term memories are still intact. They're still good. But the short term memory, the conversation they had with their daughter in the parking lot five minutes ago gone no remembrance of that so the short-term memory and what we find is that it gets shorter and shorter so uh, you know initially maybe they'll forget stuff that happened the day before or two hours ago pretty soon it gets shorter and shorter to five minutes a minute ago um, and we actually do testing for that you know to kind of measure how their short-term memory is and how that does, helps how does that us go Mm -hmm. So you mentioned like four or five things, mm -hmm. and then and then and then we'll ask them another question, and then we'll come back to it and say, okay, what were those four or five things, mm. and see, you know, how they do. If they can only remember one, are they okay? <laughs> I'm only 51 years old. If you asked, if you gave me four things, and we talked for a little bit, and you came back to it, and you said, what are the four things? I think I'd be like, um, I might be hard pressed to get one or two of those out. So well, fortunately, it's a score out of 30. Oh, so okay. the the recall itself is only five points of the 30 points. Um, but one of the interesting things I find about memory is that our attention really pays a big role in how well we remember things. So when folks are under stress or they're grieving because they've lost a loved one or there's just a lot going on, they've moved or they're traveling, their short-term memory can really disappear because they're just not able to pay full attention to what they're doing. And so sometimes I'll tell folks, if they're seeing me in the midst of just chaos in their lives, let's wait for the dust to settle a little bit before we jump to conclusions. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. So uh, are you saying that someone could have an incident like that when uh, you know their spouse dies, because I would think mm -hmm. if, when that happens, it's a huge for sure. It's a huge thing, and yes. so if they start to forget a couple things, it can actually be okay. It's like a natural occurring thing. Well, if it's temporary, mm -hmm. if you know, as they heal and as they sort of start to get back into life, they you know their memory comes back. So often, what we'll see is a little dip, and then their memory score will actually come back up um, oh, wow. later. So. There's a lot of, um, there, there's something called mild cognitive impairment, which is a step before dementia. So we, I like to tell people there's three zones of memory scores. There's the normal zone, there's mild cognitive impairment, and then there's dementia, which again means memory problems that affect everyday life. So the mild cognitive impairment are the mild memory problems. And these are the ones that, yeah, we have good days, bad days. Some days people are just on it. They're sharp. Other days they're more a little bit slow or, or distracted. Um, there's a lot of other things going on and they just can't seem to retain anything. So mild cognitive impairment can be a early warning sign that the person might be developing dementia, but it can also just be just where they are and they can stay in that zone for a long time if they don't develop dementia. So that's that's sort of all my, always my hope, is we can keep people in the mild cognitive impairment zone and not actually progress to dementia by doing some of the things to keep the memory healthy. Oh, interesting. Um, once again, we're here with Hawaii Matters speaking with Dr. Christina Bell. Uh, she's a geriatrician at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we are talking about dementia today. Uh, what are some of the risk factors for dementia? Well, the biggest risk factors for dementia are the things that hurt our brain cells. So things like high blood pressure, 
you know, not taking your blood pressure medicines, diabetes, high cholesterol, all of these things cause blockages in the tiny little blood vessels in our brains. These, these blood vessels are like hair size. They're so small. And these diseases, especially diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol can actually cause blockages that then hurt the brain cells. So if you have enough of those, you can they have found that both Alzheimer's disease and the dementia due to strokes have these changes in the brain on on CAT scans and MRIs. Hmm, interesting. Um, now, uh, we talked about diabetes being maybe one of the causes. Mm -hmm. Are there other things that can cause it as well? Yeah, so there's... Um, or risk factors, I'm yeah, sorry. There's, there's some other risk factors, and um, these kind of go in a little bit into the types of dementia. So I... I tend to tell folks there's there's broadly four kinds of dementia. The most common that everybody's heard of is Alzheimer's disease, and that's what all my patients are afraid of, that they're, that they're gonna get Alzheimer's disease because their mother had it or somebody had it. Um, the other types are vascular dementia, which is related to a stroke. Um, and there's also a dementia that we're seeing a lot now with our football players in the NFL and the, and the folks coming back from the military, the right. ones from head injuries. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a, th a fourth category of dementia that are related to sort of neurologic problems, things like um, Parkinson's disease and frontotemporal dementias and some of these other syndromes that neurologists often help us care for. Hmm, interesting. Um, now, uh, you were saying that there are some, I guess, exercises that people can do if oh, they're starting yes. to get <laughs> some of these onset things. So if you could kind of go over yes. that a bit. So this is actually my favorite part of seeing patients is giving them the pep talk of all the things they can do to keep their brains healthy. Because I think this is the part that folks are um, needing to hear. And it's an area of active research. There's a lot going on in this field right now. So stay tuned because there will be a lot more to come in the future on this area. Um, we know for sure that exercise, um, our own Honolulu Heart Program here in Hawaii has demonstrated that walking is related to lower risks of dementia, which is fabulous. Um, we also know that activities that involve the brain, like you know playing cards, doing um, puzzles, mahjong, hanafuda, like whatever you like, go play back blackjack with your friends, play poker, have a poker game. Just don't smoke, don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, also staying social is really important. So sometimes when folks start to have memory problems, they start to avoid social interactions because they're embarrassed. They don't want to forget someone's name. And what I tell folks is, Get out there, do it, because chances are good your friends don't remember some people's names too. And if you kind of make a joke about it, it breaks the ice and everybody's able to just enjoy themselves. But at least getting out there and being with other people, you really have a chance to exercise that brain, which is so good. And it makes you feel good, which helping your mood helps your memory. Mm. Um, so that's a really good thing. There's also some um, really good research on diet. Uh, there's starting to be more data that the more Mediterranean type of diet, more fish, uh, vegetables might be helpful in um, reducing risk of, of dementia. And um, Dr. Craig Wilcox here has done some really interesting studies um, looking at some of um, the predictors of healthy aging in, in, our, in our men here in the Honolulu Heart Program and, and Lifespan Study. So that's, that's really neat too. Um, let's see, other things, being careful about stress, uh, taking care of your mood, and then finally, being careful about not too much alcohol. So the interesting thing about alcohol with aging is, if you think of your body like a swimming pool, our swimming pool is shrinking as we get older. So that same glass of beer in an, in an 80 year old is a much smaller swimming pool than it was in a 40 year old or a 20 year old. Hmm. So even though they're drinking the same amount, it's much more concentrated. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, you see totally how that? Makes sense, right? So we tell folks, yes, even though you used to be able to handle four beers a night, now your swimming pool is smaller, you gotta cut down. And when folks are over the age of 85, we generally recommend no alcohol on a daily basis or just like a half of a half of a drink, you know, something much less. Um, starting to cut down because it really 
really has an impact on those brain cells. So when you're saying that the pool is shrinking, mm-hmm, does mm-hmm. that mean the areas of the brain shrink down? Or? No. So actually, alcohol goes in our body in the free water space of our body, which is generally our muscles. One of the normal processes of aging is that the muscles, and I hate to break this to you because it's happening to you and I already. Oh, it's, it's happening to me. Our muscles are turning to fat. Right. So fat is a different body space. The alcohol doesn't go in the fat space spaces. It only goes in the water spaces. And so as we age, that water space in our bodies, through our whole bodies where the alcohol goes, is shrinking. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Wow. Hey, um, you know, one of the other things that uh, when you're talking about some of the ways that you can help people um, that maybe have the dementia thing Mm -hmm. that's beginning, um, I think some people have a hard time with it. So they, and I've had, because I've had some friends who's parents are sort of starting to get that thing happening or um, uh, parents who's like one spouse is starting to experience it possibly Mm -hmm. and what it becomes is uh, sometimes um, they try to help them by testing them all the time you tell them something and then five minutes later like okay what did I say what you know that that kind of thing yes Um, sort of pressuring them to Mm -hmm. remember stuff and Mm -hmm. I don't know but I get the sense that that's probably not the best way to go about doing it yes so one of the things that happens when we're caring for a loved one who's starting to have memory and thinking problems is it's very anxiety provoking for us because we're we're literally sort of watching the person disappear a little bit and so it can be very upsetting and so families it it makes complete sense why they want to try to test them because that's what we do in school right We, we make them study we test them unfortunately with dementia what we find is that kind of pressure that kind of confrontation tends to either make the person's brain just kind of freeze up, you know, like when you're put on the spot, your brain, your mind goes blank and you can't mm-hmm. think of anything. Oh, it happens to me all the time, yeah. <laughs> or sometimes a person will actually get upset, which of course then their memory just goes out the window. So we tend to tell families, try to just roll with the different things that come up, but not so much to confront or remind or quiz um, because that tends to be more stressful for families Mm -hmm. and and for uh, for the patient i tell families all the time this is a marathon not a sprint so you got to pace yourselves caregivers especially have to take care of themselves and that means taking turns making a schedule so that different family members take different shifts if needed hiring caregivers one wonderful resource that's really underutilized in honolulu and and actually maui has excellent um, services also are some of the adult daycare centers now i like to call them senior centers because i i don't like the word daycare for seniors but (laughs) um there's some fabulous places and what that does is give the person a structure a daily activity to go to some families call it work you have time to go to work dad and they go and they do activities and they play bingo and they do paperwork or whatever whatever they can think of that will help keep the person engaged and thinking it just you it's a use it or lose it we got to we got to use those brain cells or we stop having them they stop working mm. so that can be huge the worst thing folks can do who are, have a mild dementia is just stay at home and watch TV. That's that's just the worst thing because TV is very passive and they're just on the receiving end. So they're not talking about it with someone. They're not sort of processing it. They're not writing about it or anything. They're just sort of passively receiving this information. So I would encourage anyone, if you're listening to this and you have a mild dementia, go talk about this this show with somebody process it you know engage with other people so that you can really be using those brain cells oh uh, once again hawaii matters we're here speaking with dr christina bell uh she's a geriatrician with kaiser permanente we're very happy to have her with us um now if you are looking at your parent and you're trying to make the decision between dementia and normal age, you said there are four normal age-related changes? Yes, so uh, the main things with aging uh, that we see is, we already talked about difficulty learning new things, um, and then it also takes longer to recall information. It also is much harder for folks to multitask. So. This is actually, I'm noticing this even with teenagers, 
nobody really multitasks. What we do is we shift between task to task. So that's why we're not allowed to text and drive, right? Because our brain literally is only texting or only driving. It can't do both at the same time. And it what seems happens? Like it, though. <laughs> I know that people tell themselves right? they the can ones do are both. The tickets are saying, no, 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 but I can totally do both things at once. But they can't. <laughs> And so what happens with aging is that shifting slows. So from one task to another slows and things get missed. So I like to tell the story of the man who's out watering in the yard and the phone rings. So he drops the hose and goes in and answers the phone. And the wife comes out and says, why'd you leave the water running? And he says, well, I, I didn't. I was, I was answering the phone. He, he didn't even make a memory of what happened to the hose because he was so fixated on already he'd switched the, to the task of answering the phone. And so he didn't kind of watch and see what did happen to that water. Did I turn it off? He didn't think about any of that. So that's a classic example of the multitasking. So I tell folks, please try very hard. If you're cooking at the stove, don't do anything else. The mailman comes to the door, you tell them, just a minute, please. And you turn that stove off before you leave the stove. You have to do one thing at a time because otherwise just catastrophic events can happen in terms of houses burning down or people getting hurt. You talked a little bit about um, making sure that they engage with people and talk to people and stuff like that. Exactly. Um, I know that it can sometimes be difficult to get them to do that. Um, uh, and I'll share a little bit of my own personal stuff. Uh, my father has... Uh, has Parkinson's mm-hmm. early onset of it um, and it's progressed fairly rapidly but the thing that you were talking about making sure that they get out and they talk to people and do those kind of things because he has certain days where it's good and certain days where it's bad and certain times where it's good and certain times where it's bad um, it can be challenging to do that Absolutely. plus you've got friends who are you know his friends and stuff who are outside and it's almost like they feel like they're going to catch it somehow if they don't mm. talk you know, if they come and talk to him or, yes. or engage with him somehow. Yes. Um, I, I'm not sure what all the, the feelings are with people, but mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out ways to get him to do that. Yes. Other than shaming his friends and telling them, no, you got to come to the house and sit down with my father. Because that, that yeah. seems like a, not the best way to go about doing that. Well, I think you bring up a really common question. And, and that's, it's hard on both sides. So the person with dementia feels embarrassed. Um, they may feel not, not confident in their interactions with other people anymore. Um, at the same time, the family or the friends aren't sure, they're not confident how to interact. So it's, it's an uncertainty on both sides. What I would tell folks is, Anytime you can use humor to break the ice, it makes things so much easier. If you can just set things on the table and say, you know what, I might forget your name. Know that you're, you're my good friend and I still, I still really appreciate you. It's just that my brain doesn't always process right. You know, if you can just put things out on the table and just go for it, just do the stuff that you like. Uh, one of my favorite things to tell my older men patients is get out there on the golf course even if you just ride in the golf court and you don't even hit at least you're getting fresh air you're thinking about which putter the other guy's using you're trying to keep track of the scores i mean, just try to get out there it's kind of like you know just do it you know you just want to just try to um stay as active as you can. I just can't emphasize that enough that it really is a use it or lose it. And so for our friends of our loved ones with dementia, uh, really encouraging them, you're not gonna make a mistake. It's okay, just try, just try to be with them because this, this time right now is precious. One of the things with dementia is it does progress. So if you can spend time now with them while they still enjoy it, while they're still capable, you're never going to get this time back and then you'll have really good memories in the future and that's priceless so i would just really encourage people use this time when you have it as far as dementia goes is it a hereditary thing wonderful question there are some dementias that are very strongly hereditary however most of us um, who may have family members with alzheimer's disease or stroke dementia for most of us it's it's not it's not uh one of the things i try to reassure children of folks with dementia is just because your parent has it doesn't mean you have it now it's a great time in our midlife to start exercising 
take care of our diet, take care of our blood pressures, get that diabetes under control so that our brains are nice and healthy so we reduce our risk because that's that's the best thing you can do. And there's actually been studies I just saw in one of the journals that even in patients with strong family history and a high genetic risk of dementia that certain, you know, the diet we talked about, like the Mediterranean diet or fish and and vegetable kind of diets um, can really lower their risk of dementia, even when they have a strong genetic component. So there's some really exciting stuff. And it's, there's a lot of hope um, in in this in this field. So keep yeah. the pool clean. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> to use one of your, your metaphors for this. Yes, um, no, to cut down on the alcohol, yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, self-medication is not a good thing. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. Speaking of medication. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, can medication cause dementia? That is a wonderful uh, topic that I really wanted to make sure we mentioned because there's some really dangerous stuff out there for our brains. And I'm talking about in the cold remedy aisle of our local drugstore. So over-the-counter medicines uh, that contain a medicine called diphenhydramine, which is a very common antihistamine, basically all of those cold medicines that help reduce sneezing or dry out your nose and your sinuses, many of them have an ingredient that's an antihistamine. And the older antihistamines Basically, what I tell families is they work the exact opposite of one of our medicines for dementia. So they actually, when they do studies on people and they give them these medicines, or also there's a class of medicines called benzodiazepines, which are used for anxiety and sleep, uh, like Valium and Ativan and Xanax. Um, when they give when they give people a memory test and then they give them these medicines, their memories go down, their scores go down. Now it's a reversible cause in that if we can get people to stop taking these medicines, and some people take them every day, so it can be a little challenging to get yourself off of these medicines, but once you do, your memory does improve. So it's really important to know about these medications and avoid them because everybody thinks it's over the counter. It's, it must be safe, uh, especially be careful about the over the counter sleeping pills. These ones are especially dangerous because we think it's over the counter, it must be safe. But if it says something something PM at the end of the name, um, those have that antihistamine in them. And older what is the adults- What's called again? Uh, diphenhydramine or the the brand name is Benadryl, um, and um, there's other ones, Chlortrimeton, um, and some other, if, if you have a pharmacist, um, they can help you identify those. Um, in geriatrics, we actually have a, a list of medicines to avoid in older adults that we call the beer criteria. Oh, wow, <laughs> Not like really? drinking beer, but it's, it's a man's name. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, um, as far as uh, medicines that cause dementia, are there medicines out there now that actually help people? Well, it, this is an area of active research. Right now we have two medicines that have been shown in research studies to slow memory loss a little. I, All of us geriatricians kind of wish there was something that just would stop memory loss. A magic loss. pill would <laughs> yes. be awesome, right? Yeah. That's what we're waiting for. That doesn't exist yet, but the medicines we have are better than nothing in most people. And so it is something to talk about with the doctors. There's certain people that shouldn't take these medicines because of side effects, um, but it is definitely something that you should talk to the doctors about um, for your loved one. Yeah. Wow. Believe it or not, we're almost out of time. Uh, <laughs> so I just wanted to touch on a couple quick things. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that people worry about when they're getting older is the loss of uh, being able to kind of take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Independence. You know, independence, that's the <laughs> yes. word. Thank you very much. See, already it's hitting <laughs> no, me. Um, and one of those things uh, is driving. Yes. So do yes. you have a guideline that you give people for that? Well, what I like to tell folks is retiring from driving, just like we retire from work and other tasks of our adulthood, is a huge decision. It's very important, though, that this is looked at in when a person starts to have difficulty with memory and thinking, and particularly either visual spatial ability, so watching for those little scratches and bumps on the car that aren't explained, um, or judgment, which can be things like 
stopping in the middle of the intersection for no reason or stopping when it's a red light when it's a green light instead of a red light so things like that there's actually some checklists that physicians can download that have warning signs for when to, a person should stop driving so know that there's some really good resources out there that if if folks talk to their doctors they can get um well, one other quick thing as far as like family members when they say hey, my my mother my father doesn't recognize me anymore mm -hmm. um is there a reason why that happens well one of the common reasons is actually what we call time traveling so there's uh we all have an anchor on where we are right now so you know people are in 2019 and we're this certain age and we have you know this is what our families look like and when folks develop sort of more of a moderate dementia they may drift in terms of their time zone so they may think that they're still six years old and so they're looking for their mother and father and their childhood home and their brothers and sisters and their childhood pet and so it can be very confusing to families when they're saying, where's my mom? When's mom coming home? And the child, the, the adult daughter is saying, oh my goodness, you know, grandmother's been dead for years, you know. So what helps families is if you look at that person, try to figure out what age they think they are and look at them with those eyes, see them as that six-year-old and try to be gentle and reassuring rather than saying, no, grandma's dead, you know, mm. this is your home. The reality Don't argue of it isn't with really them. gonna help them at yes, all, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Try to instead just be very reassuring and try to use your detective skills to try to figure out what time zone do they think they're in? And then you can talk about it. Oh, should we look at old pictures? Should we think about this, you know? And you can, you can use that as a moment for bonding instead of arguing. Very nice. Uh, now, finally, uh, as we wrap up, are there any resources that you recommend to people who are trying to... Well, definitely, I think the Alzheimer's Association is a fantastic resource, and they do have some caregiver trainings. In addition, uh, Holly Kuike provides some caregiver training using something called the positive approach to aging, which has a really nice way of looking at the different stages of dementia, and it's very, very positive. So I think that's a fantastic resource. In addition, the Executive Office on Aging has some wonderful resources. Catholic Charities can help with transportation, Project Donna, and on Maui, especially the MEO, has some really good uh, resources in terms of adult daycare and elder care services so please reach out um, there's there is some really good stuff out there and then please work with your doctors too so that you get as much resources as you can wow that's awesome now we could talk about this for at least another hour and unfortunately we are out of time uh, but I want to thank again Dr. Christina Bell geriatrician from Kaiser Permanente for stopping by anything you wanted to mention in closing no thank you so much for inviting me I'm, I'm oh, glad to be here thank you very much for stopping by I appreciate it uh, we'll be back next week with more Hawaii Matters this is Devin thank you so much for joining us Aloha no Ahui Ho